I'd like to give a brief content warning before I start this episode. At points in the episode I do discuss transphobic hate crimes and I also discuss TERFs and their kind of bullshittery. I know that transphobia is kind of everywhere at the moment so if it's not something that you feel that you have the energy to listen to then I won't blame you if you skip this episode. Hello, my name is Amber and welcome to the newest episode of You Look Like a Badger, a monthly film podcast where I discuss queer cinema. It is March, a month that I specifically dedicate to queer women because it's Women's History Month. I give the months different titles and the title for for March is Ladies, Ladies, Ladies. This month I decided to discuss the ever controversial The Danish Girl. What? Can't a man watch his wife get undressed? It's new. That's very observant. I'm gonna leave it on. It's pretty. I might let you borrow it. I might enjoy that. Is there something you'd like to tell me? Is there something you'd like to know? No. I'm your wife. I know everything. The Danish Girl is a 2015 historical drama based on the fictionalised biography of the same name depicting the life of trans painter Lily Elba. Told from the perspective of her wife Gerda, the film depicts the rift Lily's transition had on their marriage and uses subjectivity to interrogate the way trans women interact with femininity. This film was controversial because of the choice to cast Eddie Redmayne as a trans woman in the leading role and incurred further controversy in its flat representation of the trans feminine experience and its inability to imbue Lily with personhood. In choosing its subjective voice, director Tom Hooper and screen screenwriter Lucinda Coxon chose to identify more with the cisgender gaze, observing Lily rather than inhabiting her point of view, making it a significantly weaker and more offensive film. Contrary to my opinions on the film and the discourse on the internet, this film was very highly praised and highly awarded as well. It has a whole dedicated Wikipedia page to the awards it was nominated for and the ones that it won. So I'll just list off a few. Alicia Vikander won the Oscar and the Critics' Choice Award for Best Supporting Actress. In general she won most of the accolades for this film. Tom Hooper won the Director's Award at the Hollywood Film Awards and the Queer Lion Award at Venice International Film Festival and Eddie Redmayne won Best Actor from the Women Film Critics Circle. As I said it was nominated for a lot more awards. It was a very highly praised film and probably the most famous film about a trans woman. On Rotten Tomatoes it has a critic score of 66% and an audience score of 72% and it has a 3.4 on Letterboxd. So generally people liked this film, people continue to like this film. Let's read some reviews. To be fair to the film, I always pick the most popular reviews on Letterboxd rather than reviews that align with my opinions but the top reviews were mostly negative. I did find the odd positive review but a lot of positive reviews tend to start with well I guess I have to be the person to defend this film. So I think these reviews kind of they do like two things. They suggest a shift in how this film has been re-examined in the mainstream and also kind of they signify how many trans film critics have tried to get their opinion out there about this film, why it's harmful, why it's not very good, why it deserves to have that re-examination. So I'm going to read a few of the reviews now. So this first one is from Ian Fastert and they say, fucking touch a dress once and you'll find out you were transgender the whole time. I like this review because if this was a different film, if this was a better film, I might forgive the way that Lily discovers her womanhood, right? But <laughs> because, you know, you have to take shortcuts when you're, when you're trying to depict something visually. So <laughs> I understand the, the logic of it where... <laughs> societally dresses are associated with women right so if you want to show a trans woman having 
a positive experience you could have a like stroke some dresses but yes it is very funny to think that is kind of the extent of the exploration of womanhood unfortunately it doesn't get much deeper than that eric henderson said eddie redmayne plays transgender the way actors in the 30s and 40s played alcoholics so i personally love watching drunk acting from in a 30s film i think it's very funny i think it's very endearing but i would definitely argue it's less offensive than the performance here and i, I will kind of talk about it because there's a there's a critic that wrote a really good piece on the way that Eddie Redmayne kind of interprets being a woman, how it does kind of feel like a caricature, and that if this was like a satirical film, then his performance might actually be really good. Like if it was satirizing what trans women are expected to be, then it might be an amazing performance. But no, unfortunately, this film is very sincere and ignorantly so. I mean, I'll say it here. You shouldn't have taken this role. And this last review from Lizzie says, The mere thought of how many people said, Of course I support trans rights. I loved the Danish girl is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> and like I said, this is probably one of the most famous films about a trans woman. I feel like Paris is Burning has definitely had a re-emergence in culture. So that could have changed. <laughs> but yeah would has everyone watched paris is burning i know i know a lot of people who have but i mean like has your mum and dad would they have watched paris is burning probably not but they might have watched the danish girl because it won an oscar i think we should just like jump right into it because i can't really talk about much else without spoiling the film i'm gonna give a spoiler warning if you haven't seen the film and you would like to watch it I would brace yourself a bit. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you watch it, but it's up to you. If it's a film that you wanted to watch, then go right ahead. But this is your warning. If you haven't seen it and you get mad at me for spoiling it, then that is your own fault. Exactly what happened between you and Sundar last night? Nothing. It was nothing. Did he know it was you? It wasn't as simple as that. I watched him kiss you. Could you please make an effort? He may have known who I was, but I wasn't always me. me, me. So that there, was a, there was a moment when I was just Lily, and I think that he could see that. Do you see? But Lily doesn't exist. We made her up. I know. We were playing a game. I know we were, but then something changed. This is absurd. We, we need to stop. You need to stop. I am going to try. In an interview, with Outward Magazine. Tom Hooper, the director of the film, said this of making this film. The challenge was really to tell her story accurately, given the time in which she lived, because many of the details of her life are missing. The evolution of understanding on this issue has accelerated so much in recent years compared to the 1920s, when Lily began transitioning that it was important to show how many doctors at the time had no compassion or even understanding of her condition. I get it, kind of, that when you're making historical fiction, by proxy you kind of end up being the main historical source, which is why I kind of enjoy when a film is wearing its a historicism on its sleeve. This film doesn't do that. It is very grounded and sincere and treats its subject as though what's being said is fact. Now, that is difficult to do because a lot of the information about trans women in the 1920s was destroyed by Nazis. So just in general, when I was looking for information about Lily, it was hard to find stuff that wasn't drawing directly from the film. So you have her actual autobiography that she wrote. But other than that, there isn't a lot going about her. And it was really hard to find a biography of Lily Elba that doesn't immediately misgender and dead name her within the first sentence. Before I even get into the film, I am gonna give you a 
full biography of who she was as a person. Now, what I want to state before I go into this is that it's not the job of the film, of any film really, to be accurate. It's really just there to be entertaining and to also explore its themes successfully, cohesively, interestingly, in a way that serves its characters. Now I ask, what is the purpose of being a historical in the case of telling Lily's story? Why would we change certain details? Are we catering to a cis audience who probably struggles to understand trans women in general and would prefer to alleviate that stress of having to do actual work to try and understand them and just draw on stereotypes and stuff that we've seen before. All of these things should be considered when watching a film made by cis people for cis people about trans people. Here is a fairly comprehensive biography of Lily Elba from what I personally could find. I'm not claiming to be the most accurate source of information so obviously I will leave all my links um, in the description of this episode for the sake of transparency. Lily Elba was a prominent Danish landscape painter in the 1920s. She studied art at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen and met her future wife Gerda Gottlieb while studying there. The two fell in love and got married in 1905. Elba specialised in landscape painting in a post-impressionistic style, while Gerda found employment as a book and magazine illustrator. In 1924, Lily's work, which included landscapes, interior scenes, still lives and portraits, was shown in Paris. With the aid of her similarly queer wife, Gerda, Lily discovered she was trans partly by accident. When Gerda asked her to sit in for a female model who failed to turn up for one of her paintings, at first Albert resisted, but at her wife's insistence, she eventually conceded and dressed in the model's clothes. She wrote in her autobiography, I cannot deny, strange as it may sound, that I enjoyed myself in this disguise. I liked the feel of soft women's clothing. I felt very much at home in them from the first moment. After walking in on a modelling session, a friend of the couple, Anna Larson, suggested the name Lily for her new persona. It was soon adopted and she began appearing more often outside of modelling sessions in public. The surname Elba was later chosen in honour of the river that flows through Dresden, Germany, the site of her last surgeries. In 1912, the couple moved to Paris, where Elba was able to live openly as a woman. Gerda remained supportive of her wife for the next 15 years. This is in spite of the fact that they divorced amicably in October 1930 with an official annulment from King Christian X of Denmark. During her trans journey, doctors and psychologists labelled Lily as schizophrenic to describe her internal conflict with her gender. She decided to undergo a series of groundbreaking procedures at the Dresden Clinic of Kurt von Eckross in Germany and was also examined by German physician and sexuality theorist Magnus Hirschfeld. Once she had completed some of her surgeries, she stopped painting explaining in her diary that it is not my brain, not with my eyes, not with my hands that I want to be creative, but with my heart and with my blood. My fervent longing in my woman's life is to become the mother of a child. She expressed that she eventually killed who she used to be while setting herself free when she chose to have gender confirmation surgery. She met and fell in love with French art dealer Claude Lejeune. He proposed and the couple planned to marry. Lily hoped surgery would allow her to bear a child and to build a family with her husband. She went through another round of operations in September of 1931, this time with the goal of successfully transplanting a womb into her body. Elba died as a result of the procedure on the 13th of September 1931. Before I move on to the next section, I would like to apologise for all the mispronounced French that I just did. Um, <laughs> But still, in terms of accuracy, you can kind of see from the outside the bare bones of the film. Unfortunately, I think what the job of the film should have been was to bring to life Lily, not simply 
hash out these facts. And as I'm going to get into, the way that these facts have been arranged and retold to us is incredibly interesting. No, we've never done that. Lily's never spent the night. It doesn't matter what I wear. It's when I dream. They're Lily's dreams. Let's say that you are Tom Hooper and you have been tasked with directing a film about a prominent trans woman and you've never met a trans woman you aren't a trans woman and you don't really know that much about what it means to be a woman at all how do we kind of go about making this come to life what is it that we are trying to put across about what trans womanhood means i personally think that that first sentence that i just said is more introspective about womanhood about what it means to be a trans woman than the entire film and we're gonna get into why that is when i went into this i really wanted to be the person that found something good to say about it something meaningful but what i came away from it thinking was wow i wish that would have been explored more or i wish this that hadn't been included or i wish this entire film actually cared about what lily thinks so i speculated on what tom hooper's thought process was but we actually have you know interviews with him so i can give you an idea according to an interview hooper did with indiewire there were transgender advisors on set were available to answer questions i i i sincerely hope that those people were compensated well because wow i could not have sat through through that and then seen the end result and it was this because okay i think yeah we'll, we'll start with addressing the eddie redmayne thing so i'll start with the quote that hooper gave about casting eddie redmayne so he said this i suppose i feel that gender is a spectrum and we all have a balance of masculine and feminine the thing about eddie is he is drawn to the feminine he has played women's parts before he had a body of work playing women's roles i wanted him to go deep into himself to dig into that feminine side the problem with this is that if this film was a lot looser if this film was a lot less dry i think i could maybe see the way that exploring that balance of masculine and feminine would have been interesting right but what instead came about was a very kind of tight to the point biopic right so there is no kind of loose interpretation there's no kind of open space around the role so what we instead have is a tradition in hollywood of casting cisgender men to play trans women people have articulated this better than me but i will i will give it a go it's an incredibly dangerous pattern because in the brain of cisgender people trans people probably don't come onto their radar very often if if we're being honest the the only reason that trans people have come into the, the the kind of mainstream is because there have been prominent activists there have been prominent celebrities who are trans and who as an extension of their identities have brought being trans into their eyeline right so the way your average person interprets transgender identity is through the news and through the tv and films that they watch and probably to to a smaller extent through the validation or lack of validation of their cisgender friends who have an opinion on trans people if they do for most people if they don't have trans friends, if they don't interact with the transgender community really in their day to day lives, the only way they're going to interact with them is through examples like this film and through 
the awful things that the mainstream news cycle has to say about trans people. So when you cast a cis man in a role meant for a trans woman, you are confirming what many cis people already think about trans women, which can be a number of terrible awful things. It's a very much a focus on the performance of womanhood or what people perceive to be womanhood rather than the actual experience of it. When you conflate being a cis man with being a trans woman even though they are quite different experiences you are able to give a plausible deniability for bigots who simply believe that being trans is a mental illness that is kind of a delusion you know it's there to appropriate or parody the experiences of cis women which is the point of view of many turfs it's dangerous because the end result of people thinking trans women are just cis men is that many trans women are murdered because of this fact trans women are seen as invading women's spaces because trans women are seen as tricking men into being attracted to them basically being a trans woman you can't really win and that, that's not helped when very talented transgender actresses can't get the roles that are actually written for them would having a trans woman in this part have helped the film possibly if a lot of the writing was rejigged um or if the script was thrown out entirely and just written again but at the very bare minimum it would have confirmed to the audience that it's not simply Lily was a man and is now a woman but it's more complicated than that that it is very likely that Lily was a woman the whole time and that there was a point where this was a realisation for her. I'm not trans so I can't speak to the kind of more complicated way trans people speak about their own identities. The idea of being born in the wrong body is kind of an outdated idea and I think it honestly with a more talented writer it could have been an interesting thing to address and talk about within the film. Unfortunately that didn't happen here. If more thought had been put into this, I think this controversy could have just not happened. 2015 was so long ago, wasn't it? Doesn't it feel like fucking ages ago that I remember this discourse and I think if simply somebody else had taken the reins off Tom Hooper, this could have been just a fine film, like fairly inoffensive. Instead, it's it's a bland, overly melodramatic and offensive film. <laughs> offensive in that it was boring as shit and I didn't like it. That That's more offensive to me than clumsily misrepresenting the trans experience. When you regurgitate tropes about trans people that have been popular since the fucking 90s, you haven't updated them since then, then, you know, we can all poke fun at that. But this isn't even like a good, bad film. It's just very dull and not particularly interesting. It doesn't have anything really interesting to say about what it means to be a trans woman. So instead, we're just having to sit through Eddie Redmayne do a really bad performance. And that is more offensive than the fact he's playing a trans woman. He doesn't even do it well. I will say, I do want to be fair, because both Eddie Redmayne and Alicia Vikander have said that this film kind of was a mistake and that Redmayne's performance in it was a mistake. So he said in Vanity Fair that he made the film with the best intentions, but I think it was a mistake. That even though he earned an Oscar nomination, he wouldn't take the role now, which, you know, is good in retrospect. He also said that the bigger discussion about the frustrations about casting is because many people don't have a chair at the table. There must be a levelling, otherwise we are going to carry on having these debates. Film is a visual medium, so the best way to convey a theme is simply by showing it. Now that might seem like the most, the kind of basic, <laughs> 
um, point of view, but I think the way that this film interprets womanhood is through very superficial means. So early in the film, the character of Gerda talks about the the flipping of the the gaze. So both Lily and Gerda are painters. So Gerda talks about how observing the male subject and painting them kind of flips the subjectivity of a piece of art and it kind of as a result flips the the power structure of the way art has been interpreted and goes on to be interpreted. So the kind of problem with that is that nothing is done with it unless, um, and this is the least generous interpretation, and therefore the interpretation that I really hope is not the intention of the film, is that when Gerda is talking about being a woman observing a man, that she is talking about Lily within the context of the film. Now what I'm hoping is that this is simply an unexplored theme and not an attempt at cleverness by the screenwriter to kind of highlight the way that Lily is being observed as simply a man flaunting about in women's clothing. If that is what was intended, then this is a significantly worse film. So what I'm hoping is that Tom Hooper is simply incompetent. Let's... <laughs> who knows? What the film wants us to know is that Lily yearns for womanhood and the way that this is done is by her observing, stroking, trying on dresses and stockings and shoes and this being like a moment of realization. See this is it's such a strange film right because we're an audience we're assumed to be a cis audience because that's definitely who this film was made for and we're observing a cis woman Gerda observing her trans wife and it's through all of these kind of layers of fragmentation that we view Lily and as a result we don't get a complex idea of her or how she views her own femininity. The extent we get is that she likes putting on dresses and wearing makeup and that's kind of it. Film critic Carol Grant said of these scenes in the film, this hyperbolizing of femininity is never given to Alicia Vikander's Gerda or any other cisgender characters is only for Lily. Intentionally or otherwise, Hooper's intrusive camera doesn't invite empathy, but only furthers to otherize Lily. It's quite significant that we are kind of taught to react to Lily rather than embody her. So an early scene is when Lily and Gerda are in bed and Gerda is undressing Lily to have sex and she notices that Lily is wearing a nightgown under her clothes and there's like a pause and I think it's kind of a setup for ooh what's she gonna think and then she just like doesn't really react she just kind of continues they continue on with their sexy times and it doesn't really affect anything so throughout the film particularly the early scenes those were actually my favorite scenes because it was just kind of Gerda and Lily playing with the boundaries of gender and like the effect this had on their relationship. So for the most part it didn't really affect it at all. So in real life Gerda was queer so this kind of idea of Lily being able to experiment with her gender and it not really phasing Gerda was really f kind of fun to watch. It was a bit simplistic it, it wasn't like a super incisive view of what femininity was but them like dressing up and going out together was kind of fun i wish the rest of the film had been like that because what those early scenes actually seem to do is it sets up that gerda is okay with lily when she interprets her as her spouse cross-dressing but when it becomes like a serious transition that is when Gerda takes issue with it which is 
inaccurate in terms of history but it also comes back to that whole subverting the gaze quote it stuck in my head because the 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 more sinister interpretation is that Gerda views Lily as an intrusive presence as kind of intruding on Gerda's gaze and Gerda's autonomy which if you have any kind of familiarity with the turf movement it's a major talking point that trans women are an intrusion onto womanhood and the bigots as part of this movement seek to protect cis women from trans women who view their gender as a means to access women's spaces and that if we are to apply that to this film like I said this is an incredibly sinister interpretation but it's really hard to not interpret it like that when the film does so little to explore the the idea of the gaze. Gerda's issue with Lily's transition is that it is undermining Gerda's autonomy and her power within the marriage that they have like i said incredibly ungenerous interpretation but i'm feeling i'm feeling ungenerous because the film was very dull and because it did so much to just not explore interesting things and this idea of the gaze especially when you have a film about two artists is really interesting so the fact that this entire film is just good as resentment towards trans womanhood is honestly the most interesting thing about it because there isn't anything really to offer about Lily as a person the film is just kind of obsessed with Lily as a series of woman-like signifiers and what we would expect from a film about trans women and you know like all major films about trans people there's just this, there's an obsession with surgery and with trans people's genitals similarly there is this kind of idea that trans people trans women in, in particular are like vehicles for self-hatred and meekness and a lot i think a lot of that is is down to eddie redmayne's performance who seems to interpret being a woman as simply being like a like a wallflower and very scared of male attention and in a better film where it's clear that we're meant to care about lily that could have been like interesting but it really wasn't here like how do you make a film with Alicia Vikander right there a woman who is not acting like meek and filled with self-hatred and then opposite Alicia Vikander is Eddie Redmayne who is doing this kind of parody performance of womanhood how do you not look at that and be like no no that's not that's not what it is at all <laughs> i have another quote from carol grant she says that redmayne is approximating femininity itself ratcheting his exaggerated nervous physical tics to 11. like redmayne hooper exaggerates and conflates female imagery to the point of paradising them his camera doesn't linger or observe or examine it leers what they give us are the stereotypical tropes of a housewife simple retail job gossiping with the girlfriends desperately wants to have kids of her own with nothing else to define her like the rest of the film her ultimate form of femininity is a simplification a caricature now it wouldn't be a terrible movie about queer people made by not queer people if there wasn't a hate crime scene now from my research i couldn't really find any instance of Lily being the victim of a hate crime I'm not saying it didn't happen I'm just saying that it's interesting to focus on it because it, there was really no need but I think as I said in my Stonewall episode there is an obsession with misery and pain when it comes to historical accounts of LGBT figures and I think to an extent I understand the desire to represent the past as 
worse than right now. I think in your brain what you're meant to do is look at a hate crime happening and be like, wow, I guess I'm glad it's not the 1920s, I should sure wouldn't want that to happen to me now. But the reality is that anti-trans hate crimes have kind of always been there, so it really doesn't work in this film and all it really does is tick the boxes of what we expect a trans woman to have to endure and that I think is what Hooper interprets trans womanhood as which I think to an extent can be applied to womanhood in general when we kind of look at these films who you know want to impress the awards circuit and want to be remembered as important is that womanhood is suffering right it's this kind of terrible existence that's filled with oppression and pain so trans womanhood must be the absolute worst and i think when you don't have a measured hand in making a film like this when you don't really understand trans women or what they think and do you kind of you get a film that is incredibly limited in its point of view incredibly boring in the way it interprets queer pain because i'm not against exploring oppression and pain that marginalized people have experienced I think it can be very interesting. The problem is that when a scene is in there, in a line of things that are just suffering that this character has experienced, it all kind of blends together. So the end result is just that Lily suffered and then she died and then that's it. And it, it, it really does fail to understand why this woman was an important figure in history. And, you know, as an extension, why women like her in the 1920s were as interesting and brave as they were why she deserved to be remembered that that honestly was a more frustrating thing about this film is that because lily kind of has no personhood in this film it fails to understand why she should be remembered and that's incredibly insulting because i'm sure she was an incredibly interesting person. She had incredibly meaningful things to say about her own gender and what it means to be a trans woman in that environment. They fictionalised the reaction to Lily's transition. Gerda was very supportive of Lily. The like resentment that Gerda has is entirely made up. First time we met, I was leaving the academy and she was sitting on the steps and she propositioned me. Is that true? He was so shy, so I asked him out. And you said yes. Well, she made me. She seemed so sure. I was sure. I still am. But we went for coffee. And after, I kissed him. And it was the strangest thing. It was like kissing myself. We need to discuss the problem with Gerda. Because it is a problem. It makes this film significantly worse. Gerda in this film is kind of like the straight man. She's kind of like the setup. Unfortunately, this film kind of feels like all set up and no punchline. It just kind of keeps going and going and then, oh, the film's over. What do we get from telling the film from Gerda's perspective? We kind of are made to see Gerda as the aggressor in the relationship. So we view this marriage as, I don't know, I think the filmmakers thought that they were very clever and kind of subverting the dynamic and Gerda's the man and and Lily's the woman and ooh isn't that a subversion Gerda is the person moving the action along so she is the protagonist she encourages Lily to go to a party in makeup and a dress and a wig she is the person that when they're telling the story of how they first met, she's the one that asked Lily out and she is pursuing her art in spite of kind of being a woman, right? That is the way that this film is set up, right? We're meant to see Gerda's journey as an artist and what 
obstacles she's coming up against. And it is quite strange to put this storyline in a film about a trans woman who allegedly is the main focus of your film. So why? Why would why would they do this? Why would they instead choose to focus on Gerda instead of Lily? When you are a clueless cis person, it is easier to tell the story of a cis person observing a trans person's journey into their gender rather than trying to and failing to tell the story from Lily's perspective. Now, at the hands of Tom Hooper and Lucinda Coxon, if this was a different script, where Lily was the main character, would this film have just been endless scenes of Lily fondling dresses? Would that have just been the whole film? Is that the extent of these two filmmakers knowledge on trans women because it really does seem like it the film wants to be about marriage i think it's about the way that gerda is usurped in her own story by lily i think to some extent the the film seems frustrated to even have to focus on lily we keep jumping back to gerda she is angry that Lily exists and that Lily is enjoying herself being a woman. So as a result, the audience is meant to also be frustrated with Lily's selfishness in transitioning. I think, you know, I was talking about sinister readings of this film, but it, it only really does more to solidify the interpretation that this is a film about a cis woman's autonomy being encroached upon by her spouse. As a result, we are meant to interpret Lily's journey as selfish. We're meant to empathise with the way that Gerda survives her wife's transition. And we are encouraged to side with her during the fights that they have. The breakdown of their marriage and the subsequent failure of heteronormativity and cisnormativity is all linked back to Lily being a trans woman. Again, we're not having many generous interpretations of this film. In fact, I think it seems to be getting more awful as I'm describing it, which, is, which isn't good. A term that, if you haven't heard it, then I'm going to unfortunately have to introduce to you, is a term that can like really easily be mapped onto this film almost kind of foreshadowing the the trend of what what are known as trans widows now this term is born out of cis women's resentment of trans women existing which you know there's been a lot of that recently often in the name of feminism but the phenomenon of trans widows as described in an article in the metro refers to the heterosexual partners of people who have come out as trans and transitioned usually from male to female the expression seems to have stuck with anti-trans activists in particular it's being used in a very serious sense as though their partners have died and they are left with the profound anguish and guilt that comes with grief to see someone you supposedly love gain confidence and trust you with information they've been carrying for years perhaps decades only to tell them and the internet that they are now as good as dead strikes me as both deeply callous and self-centered because cis people are kind of taught to center their own experiences in everything the the idea of of trans people simply existing is kind of seen as an affront to their own existence which is why the narrative in in real life comes about of of trans widows of cis women who view their partner's transition as a loss to them, as an affront to them and their heterosexuality and their life. This film's affirmation 
of the idea that that a cis person's perspective is more valuable and more interesting and more progressive is not only dull as shit but honestly kind of dangerous. Fortunately I think this film has mostly fallen out of the zeitgeist. I think there have been enough trans actors out there but I think in terms of what is there to point to for the interpretation of trans people this is a massive example. Whilst discussing it has been kind of exhausting it's probably important. I mean I hope you didn't go and watch it because that would have been terrible for you. <laughs> does this film look like a badger? Yes. Yes it does. <laughs> this film is unable to view Lily as a person. It refuses to. It, it doesn't give her autonomy, it doesn't give her a point of view. This film is filtered through Gerda's perspective which is historically inaccurate as it is and instead it turns this story into a marriage drama when it really didn't need to be. This film is dull, the performances are not very good, everyone seems to be unfit for their roles, it's unable to transcend stereotypes and filters the trans experience through a cis gaze and it casts this cis man in the role of a trans woman. I don't want you to come away from this podcast with nothing so I'm gonna give you two recommendations <laughs> just to calm down after watching this film. So the first recommendation is an episode of Euphoria, which is not something I ever thought I'd be recommending on this podcast, but hey ho. So the episode is called Fuck Anyone Who's Not a Sea Blob. Now, in general, I have strong negative opinions on Euphoria, but I'm not going to go into it here. I think this episode felt very honest and sincere. Um, it was written by Hunter Schaefer who is a trans woman, she's an actress, and it kind of gives some perspective, some fairly intimate perspective on what it means to be like a trans teenage girl dealing with a relationship with a person who's probably not very good for you. Whether you could watch this as a standalone episode, I think you could get something from it even if you haven't seen the show because it, it feel it's very honest I think and it's very it's fairly self-contained. I think it's worth a watch. The second recommendation is a film and this film is called Lingua Franca. It's a drama about a trans woman who has immigrated from the Philippines to the US and begins a relationship with a cis man. This film was written, directed and stars Isabel Sandoval who is a director that I follow on Letterboxd. <laughs> this film is very good. It's a film trying to interpret being a trans immigrant during the Trump era. There's tense moments but it's really like sensitive and intimate and yeah, it's definitely worth a watch. Thank you very much for listening. I'm aware that this was a similarly long episode. I I found out about myself that I can talk for a long time about things I don't like. My next episode should be in April where I will discuss films for queer youth, queer kids and queer teens, films that are for them. If you'd like to stay updated, please make sure to follow me on Twitter at Like a Badge Pod. Follow me on Spotify, YouTube, and TikTok for full episodes and teasers. If you want to see more of my work, you can find my writing at ambercomwalk.com. If you'd like to give me a tip, you can donate to my coffee, which I'll put in the description. All of my sources are also in the description. Thank you for listening once again, and I hope to see you in April. Bye!